Today is the third Sunday, I believe, which is our new Sunday, but we plan something a little bit special since we are in the season of, uh, of Easter. Next Sunday, of course, will be, will be Easter. And so uh, uh, we just have something. I, I, it's my prayer that you will thoroughly enjoy and get a blessing from the service today, not because of me, not because of anybody in particular, but, but because of the Lord and what he lays on your heart. Uh, if you want to, you can turn in uh, your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, and uh, we'll, we'll be reading there here shortly. One thing for a visitor's sake, this, uh, this green sheet here is important. If you'd like to join our church, we would love to have you. And we just add, this is uh, the uh, uh, membership application. Just fill it out and give it to me or drop it in the offering bucket. It's back there by the back door. It's been pointed to by Brother Rob right now. And the green sheets also. He's uh, right there by them. So, so get you one of these. We would love to have you as a member of Circle J, go to work for Jesus here. All right. Uh, today is a special day. It's Palm Sunday, as I'm sure you are well aware. And uh, but, but the message today is not going to be centered in on, on Palm Sunday. We're going to wait a few weeks and, and have a message about uh, that involves Palm Sunday. I'll tell you this much, and you can be looking for it. In the book of Daniel, a formula is given to Daniel by God for when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would reveal himself to the people. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus revealed himself to the people. And if you figure out this formula... I'll tell you this ahead of time. If you figure out the formula, the date for Jesus' revealing himself on that Palm Sunday comes to Palm Sunday today in 33 AD. Now, I think that's pretty amazing because most scholars believe that it was 33 AD or a little bit at that, uh, you know, a year or two either side of that that Jesus revealed himself, and of course, he was crucified. And if you remember, Palm Sunday was the beginning of what, what churches call the Holy Week, uh, Friday of that week. Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary. On the Thursday night, on the Thursday night before that Friday, Jesus observed a Jewish traditional meal. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, and you're probably familiar with the Passover. I'm sure you've heard the term Passover. And I did this a few years ago, but a little bit less. I mean, I did it by myself. And if you've ever eaten any of my cooking, you'd probably be sick like Robert is today, but he didn't eat the cooking. So I don't mind you for that. But, I, I want to ask, I want to ask the, the people that were involved. We have ladies and gentlemen who are involved in preparing a Passover meal for us to sample. Would you would you just stand? Those of you who who helped in any way, large or small, to prepare to prepare this. You helped Kim, didn't you? Okay. All right. Just look around. These are people. They worked hard all week to help to prepare. Give them a hand. Okay. Now, my purpose today is to try to help all of us understand that God instituted the Passover not just to have something for, for the children of Israel to do back there in the land of Egypt. There's a great deal of meaning to the Passover. And it was no accident that Jesus was crucified there on that Friday that Passover was to begin. So you see, there's a great deal of meaning. And I hope that you will listen and that you will learn. Not that I'm any kind of authority. I am not. But I think there's a lot for us unlearned Gentiles to learn from 
the Jewish tradition of Passover. Okay? Um, if you remember, the children of Israel were in bondage and captivity in the land of Egypt. They were start serving the hard taskmasters of the Egyptians in building their cities and their monuments. And so <laughs> the children of Israel were crying out to God to free them from this bondage. And if you remember, God sent, called and sent a man named Moses to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And Moses went to Pharaoh and Pharaoh refused to allow the children of Israel to leave. And you can probably understand why he had all of this labor. And if all this labor left, they were slaves. If all this labor left, well, you know, what would, how would he build his monuments? How would he build his cities? Because there were a great number of people that were involved in this. So if you remember, God sent plagues on the land of Egypt. There were ten plagues in all. The final plague, if you will remember, was the death of every firstborn in every family. That was not just people, but also their animals. And But God created a plan for the children of Israel so that they would not be affected by this. And this is where we get the name Passover as you will see here in just in just a little bit, okay? Now I'm going to read to you. Now this is this is a a rather lengthy reading. I'm going to try to try to make it as quick as possible. But it's important that we understand it's the background here of Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse one. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, "This month is to be for you the first month." The first month of the year. Now they call it Nisan, and it's not the car. Okay? But that is the first uh, month of their year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb. Now there's meaning in all of this, so just keep in your mind that there's deep uh, uh, meaning in this. They're to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. And there's a very important reason for this. There was not to be any of it left. And if any was left, it had to be burned. The animals you choose must be your own males without defect. In other words, they couldn't get rid of their sick animals. They had to choose the best. You know what? God always deals with our best. It's something for us to remember that. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now, why did they, they tend them up for four days, basically from the 10th to the 14th, depending on how you reckon the days, three to four days. Why did they do that? Because God wanted them to look at this lamb that was to be offered. This was a lamb from their own flock. And if you'll remember, or maybe you don't remember, but anyway, these people didn't have an awful lot. And basically, they were very close to their animals. Now some of you who have horses and dogs and cattle, you can identify with this, can't you? I mean, we have two horses, Brownie and Dusty. And you know what? We're pretty close to those animals. And you get close to them, don't you? We have some dogs. We're close to them. We even have a stray cat. We've gotten close to this stray cat. <laughs> you know, we're animal people, as most of us here probably are. So you can identify. They had to watch this little lamb that was going to be slaughtered for God for the Passover feast for four days. Number one, they really got close to this animal. And number two, 
to be sure that it was as perfect as it could be, no blemish or spot at the scripture. Then they were, to, on the evening of the fourth day, at twilight, they were to take it and they were to slaughter it. Now, I know that a lot of you were wondering, I want y'all to know this is catch, okay? It's in blood. Want anybody going away here? Brother Danny. Use the blood. This is catch. Okay? All right. Hopefully that's enough. We'll see. Listen to this. Then they are to take some blood, some of the blood, some blood from this animal, from this lamb, and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat lambs. Now, I know all of you were wondering, what in the world is Brother Danny doing? And I tell you what, I'm real close here to the lady that, that cleans the church, and so I do not want her mad at me, okay? She is <laughs> going to come up and hit me if I make too big of a mess. Well, it'll stain the tape, I hope, right. if nothing else. But they were to take it, and they were to apply this blood to the door posts or the side posts or the trim, as we would probably call it today. And there was a very definite reason for this. <laughs> you can see it. I'm probably doing something I shouldn't be doing here close to the speaker. <laughs> but you know what? Hey kids, I bet you remember this. Remember this story. I'll try not to show my blue underwear. <laughs> That's what they did. Now that's kind of curious, is it not? That they did that? I mean, that they slaughtered this animal and they took some blood and they put it on the doorpost. Now, as we come over there here in just a minute, why did they that? If any of you already know. That same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your coat tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the last Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Did you ever wonder how it got the name Passover? This is how it got the name Passover. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off <coughs> from Israel or set outside the camp. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Now, why? Why did God want them to go to all of this trouble? Was it just to kind of, as I say, Make them jump through hoops? 
Was it just to make them do something? No. There was a great deal of meaning in the Passover. They were celebrating it for a week. And they were not to work during that week because God wanted them to stop and think and consider the meaning of the Passover. You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was a lamb that was slain from the, before the foundation of the world. Before time ever began, God knew that we would need a Savior. And he made provision for Jesus Christ to come. The Passover and the Passover feast was designed, God designed it, so that the people would think and realize that God had a plan for the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And everything that was done in the Passover feast and that God commanded for them to do in the Passover feast was done for no other purpose than to point the way to the day that Jesus Christ would come and be revealed to the nation of Israel on Palm Sunday, thousands of years ago. So you see, there's, there's deep meaning in this. Now we have... <laughs> We have some young people who are going to help. We're going to sample the different parts and elements of the Passover meal. Now, you already have mentioned the unleavened bread. You already have meant, we've already mentioned the lamb. Uh, but there's some other elements also that came into play in this. And I've done a little research, and I've asked our teachers of our youth to help me with this, and those are the ones that, that, that stood up. And who's going to come and help serve me? We've got some young people who are going to come and help serve me. Hey guys, y'all just come up and line up right here, okay? Now, the Passover meal was called by the Jewish people the Passover Seder. S-E-D-E-R. And basically what Seder means, it, Seder just means order of service. Have you ever come to some place, you know, a church or something, they give you this little piece of paper and it says order of service? Well, that's what Seder means. It was the order in which they, they did this. Now, we have up here, and you can come up after the service and you can look at these. We're going to pass three of these things around so that you can sample them. And the... Uh, See if I can identify all these. This is the roast lamb. Please, right? Okay. Uh, this right here is a mixture of fruit. Uh, Kim? Fruit and nuts. Huh? Fruit and nuts. Okay, they're mixed together. And and this is symbolic of the mortar that the, the uh, Israelites made in Egypt to put the bricks together for building. And then also, we have, if you'll notice, an egg, or a hard-boiled egg. Oh, I should eat it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never pass the kitchen test, would I? <laughs> Working in the kitchen. Uh, but basically, this has a meaning, and I'm just going to have to read that one to you. And they have Jewish names for all of these. The, uh, the mixture of fruit and nuts was called cherisin. And the uh, uh, I'm searching for this. No. Cherisin was fruit and nuts. The uh, the Roast lamb was called the roa. The egg was called the, I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correct or not, batsla. 
The egg was first hard-boiled and roasted and served as a reminder of the festival sacrifice during the time of the temple. After the temple, the egg was a reminder for us, the Jewish people, to mourn the suffering of all people living under bondage and slavery. Then we have uh, carpus, which was a green vegetable, usually parsley and celery, which as you can see is, is right here, which represents the reemergence of life at springtime because Passover usually corresponded with springtime as well. Now here's one that's very important. Oh. There we go. Uh, this is matzah. And believe it or not, Rita found this at Walmart. I mean, this is real matzah. This came from Jerusalem, according to the Bible. And it says on it, kosher for Passover. So we're going to have kosher matzah, which is the unleavened bread. So that's what this is. Yeah, I understand the ladies didn't like what she made before. You know, one thing that's interesting about the matzah, and this particular matzah on the box, a lot of you don't realize, you know, it, the Jews were not supposed to work during Passover. They got so dogmatic about it that all that's printed on this box is that it had to be open. The box had to be open before Passover began because that was considered work. Wow. Open the box. <laughs> and that's getting a little carried away with things, is it not? But it said it right there on the box. All right, now, we have bitter herbs. We have bitter herbs, which are called maror and chasra. Often horseradish <laughs> and romaine lettuce, and that's what we have here. And these are symbolic of the bitterness of slavery. So we, are, we have here some samples that we're going to pass out so that you can say that you sampled the Passover meal. Guys, let's go. If, if, uh, if y'all just take this and pass it around. Okay, maybe maybe y'all can get on either side and then the rest of you guys can just get in the center and just pass, keep, keep passing it around.
the bitterness of the slavery that the Jews experienced. I tell you, some of you don't like my I We've got the unleavened bread here, and once you taste the bitter herbs, you may want some unleavened bread, okay? Okay, I think we've about made it around with all of it. anybody that wants to take a sample now. Now, why in the world have I done this? Why in the world have I gone to this trouble and taken your time? The reason is because there's a great deal of meaning in all of this. Okay? And as we've already shared a little bit, let me share with you again 
the meaning of three elements here that I'd like to share with you. First is the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs, if you remember in our reading, was symbolic of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. But it also symbolizes something else. And that is the bitterness of sin in our life. The bitterness of sin, the bitterness of our slavery to sin. Let me read you a passage of scripture here from Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul writes this and he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Each and every one of us, the, the bitter herbs are symbolic of the bitterness of the sin that's in our life. And we are slaves to sin. And so this reminds us of our condition before God. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one, the scripture says. And then Paul says, for I know that Good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. <laughs> For I have a desire to do what is good. We all want to do what's good. But then just to the Apostle Paul says, Why do we not do it? I cannot carry it out. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are all sold in the bitterness of slavery to sin. And the meaning of the bitter herbs was to remind us of the bitterness of our condition in sin. And of our need for a Savior. We cannot do it ourselves. No matter how hard we try. I've had people tell me, Brother Danny, I've tried to live a good life. You know, whenever you say tried, you just admit that you failed. We've all tried to do what is right. But we cannot live up to the standards that God set for us to live up to. So that's why Jesus was a lamb slain from before the very foundation of the world. Then we have, of course, the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread is symbolic of the sinless body of Christ that was slain for us. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus instituted another, another feast for us. We call it an ordinance in the church. We call it the Lord's Supper. Some churches call it communion. But the Bible tells us that whenever he was observing, this is the night before he was to be crucified, he was observing this Passover meal with his disciples, as was their custom. And he used some of the very elements of the Passover meal to make a point with his disciples and to remind them and to remind us. Listen to this. While they were eating, while they were eating this Passover meal, Jesus took bread, the unleavened bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. This is symbolic of my body. Now how is this symbolic of the body of Christ? The unleavened bread is symbolic of the sinless nature of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us, the Bible says, on the cross of Calvary. So you see, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, you know where it comes from? It comes from the Passover feast. And the elements that we use come directly from the Passover feast. It was to remind the Jews of the Savior who would come and it is to remind us of the Savior who has come and died on the cross for our sins. Think about that for just a moment. One other element that's in the 
Passover meal that I haven't mentioned, and that is the wine. Now, this is great news. Now, there's a great deal of debate over whether it was fermented wine or whether it was grape juice. The Jews had both. And I'm not going to get in on that debate which one it was, okay? The grape juice was called new wine. It had fermented. The, the fermented version was just called wine. I don't know which one they used. That's not important. The part, important thing is this. It says, then he took, took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. That blood that was taken from that lamb, the wine, is symbolic of that. That blood that the Jews at the very first Passover took and spread on the doorposts so that the death angel, whenever he came, would pass over that house and not visit that house and no one that was inside that house would die. It's symbolic of the blood of Jesus that is applied to our lives. <laughs> The Bible tells us, in fact, Jesus said that if we place our faith and trust in him, we will never die. The death angel passes over us. Jesus said, with his blood applied to our sin, God does not see our sin, but sees the blood of his son Jesus. That's important, folks. That's important. And for, that's something for us to remember. That blood is symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. Just as the blood of that Passover lamb stained, he said it's going to stain the thing, stained the doorposts of the house, it also stained the cross of Calvary. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Then, of course, the lamb. The lamb, the meat, is symbolic of Jesus, the true lamb of God. Listen to this. John 1 and verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John knew what the correlation was between the Passover Lamb and Jesus. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why John called him the Lamb of God. In my grandmother's granddaddy's house, there was a uh, it was just a print of a painting. They couldn't afford the real painting. But there was a print of a painting that I've seen time and time and time again. That print shows a door, kind of like this door. And there's a man standing before the door, and you can tell from the painting that it's Jesus. And he's standing before the door, and he has his hand like this. Now he's standing on this side, but I'm not going to show you my underwear. So Jesus is standing there and he's knocking. Now, where did the artist get that idea? Revelation 3 and 20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone that's inside, hears and opens the door, I will come in and eat and fellowship with, with him and they with me. My friend, this is symbolic of this door. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. 
the blood that the early Jews put on the doorpost there in Egypt was symbolic of the faith that they placed in God. That that blood would save them from the death angel. What is being talked about there in Revelation 3 and 20 is if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us on the cross of Calvary, <coughs> he will save us from the death angel of God. And all we have to do is just like the early Jews had faith that God would see that and would pass over them, that God will see the blood of Jesus applied to our sins and pass over us. anyone here today that you've never placed your trust and faith in Jesus, you've never opened the door and let Jesus come into your life, into your house. The Bible says all we have to do is by faith believe. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is God's part. He did his part when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is us believing, just like those early Jews. They believed what God said, and they put that, that blood there on the doorpost. Faith is us opening our heart's door to God and allowing Him to come into our heart. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do so today. There's no magic. You don't have to go through, you know, a ritual of coming down the aisle and if you won't do that, that's fine. I'm not going to stop you. The important thing is, I don't want you to think for a moment that, you know, there's some ritual you have to go through. All you have to do is just open your heart's door and invite Jesus in. If you haven't done that already, why don't you do that? It's simple. You know what? Jesus said that unless we have the faith of a child, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you think about that. You know, a child is not some theologian, is he? A child is, is, you know, they may not know anything about the Bible. I remember whenever I was saved, the only thing I knew was my Bible had pictures in it. That's all I ever did. All you have to know is that you want Jesus Christ in your heart and life. I remember one of the first messages I ever preached. A little boy, he was probably six, seven years old, just came up to me and said, I want Jesus. That's all you have to do. Is ask Jesus in. Just a woman. Let's stand together. It is truly amazing what God has done for us in sending Jesus. Let's sing together one verse of amazing grace. I think we probably all know the first verse, but we don't need any help. Let's sing it together. Amazing grace, how sweet
Dearly Father, I just pray that no one leaves here today without experiencing that grace. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed, and you can come sample some more if you like. You left better earned. You left better earned.